It's fill-up time for Peter Kalmus. No gas stations for him. His 1984 Mercedes runs on used vegetable oil that he gets free from a sushi restaurant. This jug will get us about 120 miles. The biodiesel engine runs on biofuel, not fossil fuel. So this is not contributing to CO2. No, it's a waste product. It's not contributing to climate change. Wow. It's a waste product and it's coming from the atmosphere and then it's going back in the atmosphere. This is important to Peter. You see, he's an atmospheric scientist, an expert on climate change and global warming. Why isn't society doing more about this? This is the most urgent problem facing humanity. About 10 years ago, he realized he couldn't just study climate change. He had to change the way he lived. Peter lives in a modest home in Altadena, along with his wife, Sharon, his two boys, Braird and Zane, and their dog, Mitzi. Um, in terms of win-loss record. <laughs> they have achieved something remarkable. They have reduced their energy use by 90%, and along with it, yeah. their contribution to climate change. 90%, yeah. So from about 20 metric tons of CO2 per year, which is very close to the U.S. average, yeah. down to a little under two metric tons per year. How did they do it? Sometimes it takes a couple tries. A lot of ways, big and small. There we got it. This is the compost bin. They compost their garbage, garbage that would normally go to landfills and produce harmful methane. They use a closed line instead of a closed dryer. Peter bikes to work to the nearby Jet Propulsion Lab. These steps aren't that unusual. I have a bill from 2015 if you want it. What's unusual is how precisely Peter has calculated his carbon footprint. Then again, he's a climate scientist. So I sat down and kind of did a, little, a couple hours of internet research and figured out how much does my natural gas usage, usage contribute? How much does my diet contribute? Driving, flying, electricity, you know, buying new stuff. And when the calculations were finished, he got a big surprise. Beforehand, I was thinking electricity would be my big thing and I needed to put solar panels up. What I found instead was that flying was by far my biggest source of emissions. So anything else I did to reduce, it would basically be meaningless unless I reduced my flying. He was flying about 50,000 miles a year, mainly to conferences. So he convinced his bosses to let him go to those conferences he could drive to. By not flying, he cut his personal carbon footprint by a whopping 70%. It is a bit of a um, handicap not to be able to go to conferences and collaboration meetings, but it's a trade-off that you know I'm, I'm making very consciously, and, and I think it's... You know, I think it'll work out in the end. I think that Peter and I definitely come from a similar point of view. For Sharon, the no-fly rule is a bigger challenge. But I'm kind of in an earlier stage in my career and sort of need to be able to attend conferences and um, job interviews and that kind of thing. And how about vacations? For that, they take the train or the biodiesel veggie vehicle. Left hands up here. Sometimes I feel like your friends who are doing this great thing or buying this condo or going there and, and flying everywhere. We didn't move into a bigger house in our 40s the way that our friends did. We didn't get to do this great vacation. It's almost like a discipline, right, that consumer culture is constantly exerting on us to want to consume more and do more. And it's nonsense, right, because that stuff is not intrinsically fulfilling and it's not intrinsically meaningful. <sighs> so this makes... Okay, flying was number one. So what was their second biggest source of emissions? It was food, and that was a surprise to me. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Their meat-based diet accounted for 13% of their emissions. So they became vegetarians and cut that percentage in half. They have a big avocado tree in the backyard, along with half a dozen other fruit trees, and they have chickens. But then Peter went even further and started what's called dumpster diving. So the first time I did it, the first couple times I did it, I actually went into dumpsters with some friends who do that. It was a lot of fun, actually. It's amazing how, how clean it is, how good the food is. Um, you know, uh, the, certainly the supermarkets don't encourage people to do that, um, which made it all the more fun because it felt kind of subversive. Now you may be wondering, where are the solar panels? Well, the Kalmus family only uses 12% of the electricity of an average family, just 12%. So solar power didn't make economic sense. I estimated the payback time for us and it was on the order of 30 years. Oh. Yeah, and it would have been a huge upfront cost. But when it came to not using the clothes dryer, that required a little bargain. I put the laundry in and he hangs it out. Um, he puts it on the line. I bring it in though <laughs> and sort it into piles for the kids. So how about the kids? Well, they love having chickens. And we also have this 
giant, beautiful garden, and I really enjoy gardening. Brer knows a lot more about climate change than most kids his age. Sometimes he's a little afraid of the future, but then living this way helps. I enjoy being able to feel like I'm not using, um, cl um, affecting climate change because um, I don't want a world like the one that scientists are predicting um, what's going to happen in the future. I don't want a world like that. I'm definitely lucky. I know about climate change. I can try to stop it. I think that's lucky. And I have the resources to try to stop it. She's a great soul. Peter has put all he's learned, the science, the family's energy savings, and his philosophy in a book. It's called Being the Change. A huge change for me was having kids. And because of my love for them and because of my love for the rest of this planet, I realized that I also had to speak out as much as I could, even though that was really scary for me. I'd much rather just do science and you know, kind of write papers and live a quiet life. But I feel like I just don't have that option because this is happening so fast. I can say uh, with a lot of confidence that this is happening faster. It's much more urgent. It's much more serious. The effects are going to last much longer than the public realizes. Despite the dire warning, one thing Peter and Sharon know, they're happier living this way. I think you just have to be willing to um, go against the dominant culture and make that rewarding, that that's awesome, and that that should be something that really uh, is a kind of an implicit reward. Imagine humanity kind of as a member of the web of life. You know, are we kind of the end all and be all of evolution? Are we kind of better than all these other animals? Or are we kind of sharing this biosphere with them? And are we like kind of one species among many? Kingcatcher, the defense. I got you. Then changing your own life to live with less fossil fuels, I'm sure it'll make you happier.